I come to you in the name of the Father and Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, on this day, Good Friday, we are called to come and to kneel humbly at the foot of the cross. We are called to journey to Golgotha, to be there in the moment of torture and shame and death of our Lord Jesus Christ. But most of us, well, that's, that's a place we'd, we'd, we'd rather not go. For many, this is a day we'd rather, we'd rather just sort of bypass, go around, just only sort of momentarily, somewhat superficially acknowledge. We get it, but we're on our way to Easter, if you don't mind. We don't want to spend too much time here. We've got a place to go, and that is the place of the resurrection, the place of hallelujahs, the place of life. No thank you here. But as one of our Lenten speakers, the very Reverend Dr. Kelly Brown Douglas, the Dean of the Episcopal Divinity School at Union, Canon Theologian National Cathedral, said, whether we like it or not, the cross of Christ is at the center of our faith. That is an undeniable, unshakable truth. This day, the cross is at the center of who we are as Christians. And we, not, we cannot bypass it, we cannot get around it, we cannot skip over it and gloss over it and just, oh, thank you. We need to acknowledge it, to be there, to kneel before it, to get through it, to experience it, to get to the other side of it. We have to be in, as the words that Brian Stevenson uses in his book, Just Mercy, in talking about our relationship with the outcast, the downtrodden, the oppressed, the despised, and the marginalized, we must be in close proximity. We must be in close proximity with the cross and all that it stands for. The ugliness, and the glory and the salvation of it. Do we dare? Now, on this day, we'll, we'll sing, Were you there? Right? We, we always sing, Were you there? Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Were you there? And our answer? No. Were, were, were you there? Were you there when, when they nailed him to the tree? Were you there? No. Well, were you there then? Were you there when they pierced him in the side? No. All right, well, 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 well then, were, were you there when, when they laid him in the tomb? No. No. The invitation this day is to do that. But why don't we do that? Because the song says, sometimes it causes, but I believe it's not sometimes, it's all the time. Because all the time, that proximity with that reality causes us to tremble. To tremble. The deepest core of our hearts and souls, it causes us to tremble. I think we prefer the song, Old Rugged Cross. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross. That symbol of torture and shame. And there, oh, the fairest one, the dearest one, our Lord Jesus Christ. He was slain for all us lost sinners. Out there, out yonder, on that hill far away, on that mythical, magical, theoretical, theological hill out yonder, one named Jesus, the Son of God, out there, died for us. Out there. Now, we don't want to get 
in proximity with the gruesomeness and horror and truth of that reality. We just want to get close to the benefits of that reality. We want to get close to the benefits of the grace and glory and resurrection and life and forgiveness of that reality. But we don't want to get too close to the messiness, gruesome, and br gruesomeness, and brutality of that reality. But today we are invited to. Now I want to remind you, and I want you to listen carefully if you will. Let's remember that the cross was not, not designed, it was not the intention to bring life and hope. But rather quite the opposite. It was not to be a vehicle of salvation but of devastation and oppression and subjugation. Never was it intended to be a vehicle of hope and life, but a vehicle of despair and death. Remember that. It was used with a very specific purpose by the Roman Empire. Our Lord was not some sort of isolated case of this this lone cross on this lone hill for this one person. No, this was used regularly by the powers in the empire to keep those who were subjugated, subjugated. To keep the oppressed, oppressed. And to keep the powerful, powerful. That's what it, that was its intention. And if you mess with us, you will die. Do you understand? This was a tool meant to keep the people afraid and beaten down and subjugated and oppressed. Don't mess with us. Because if you do, we will take you and beat you and spit upon you, strip you naked, nail you to wood, hang you up until you die. And we will do it for everyone to see to remind them what's going to happen if they mess with us. Now, this, this is where, my friends, proximity should cause us to tremble, tremble. Because that story, that reality, that intentionality should sound very, very, very familiar. Because that is not a story about a hill far away in a land distant and far. That is a story about a town square in a land that we hold so dear because it is the story of our nation. It is the story, a major part of the story, an integral part of the story, a powerful part of our American story. Whether we want to admit it or not, because that's exactly, exactly what we did. Those who were in power, white people, were very clear to those who are subjugated and oppressed, specifically black people. Do you understand your place, your role in this relationship? And we want to be very clear. If you cross the line, if you so much as cross the street, if you look at us the wrong way, say the wrong thing, breathe in a way we do not like it. We will take the very breath from you. Do you understand? And it was not an isolated case of once out yonder. It happened thousands, thousands of times. White Americans would say, you crossed the line. So instead of a hill far away, they would find the tallest tree in the town square right next to the church, right next to the courthouse, right next to the park where we play with our children. And we would invite all of the white folks, family and friends, and all of the black folks, family and friends, 
to show them we mean business and to remind them of the proper and natural and God-given order of things as we believed it to be. And there we would take one and beat and humiliate and strip them and tie a rope around their neck and hang them until dead to remind those subjugated that too shall be your fate if you dare to cross us. That is a part of our reality and our story. But do we want to truthfully deal with it? It makes us tremble. Trim. But dear friends, isn't it ironic isn't it ironic, as James Cone says so powerfully and beautifully in his book, The Cross and the Lynching Tree. The Cross and the Lynching Tree. Isn't it amazing that this which was designed to be a tool of torture and shame and subjugation and oppression, isn't it amazing that this is the very vehicle in which and through which our Lord God and Jesus Christ brings us salvation? Isn't it amazing that in and through this, our Lord Jesus Christ brings us life and hope when what was designed to bring, it was designed to bring despair and death. The paradox of our faith. That in and through this very means, our Lord, our God brings life both to those who were subjugated and oppressed, those who were strung up on the rope, and those who were hung on the cross. To bring life and hope to them, and believe it or not, dear friends, salvation for the oppressors as well. If you dare to kneel in proximity at the foot of the cross with the truth of its reality, I believe, this is just my opinion, friends, that for many of us, that cross is a, is a distant reality, that old rugged cross on a hill far away. But I believe truthfully that for our African Americans, our black sisters and brothers in this country, that is not a distant reality, but an all too close and intimate proximity. Because they have seen their mama and their daddy, their grandpa, their grandma, their husband, their wife, their brother, their sister, their son, or their daughter hanging from the lynching tree. They were there. They tied the rope and hung them. They were there when they beat them in the side. They were there when they stripped them bare. And they were there when they were laid in the tomb. And when you see your own mama and daddy and brother and sister and daughter and son and friend and beloved one on the cross, on the lynching tree, boy, that gets real, real quick. And so to the powerful message of hope and life that the resurrection brings. So, dear friends, it is my firm belief that we find we take a powerful step, a powerful step toward reconciliation and healing if we are willing to go to the cross with our black sisters and brothers, with all of the truth of the cross and the truth of the lynching tree. If we are willing to honestly, soulfully, humbly go to the cross with one another and kneel before the cross with its truth of shame and death and torture, with its truth of salvation and hope and life, I believe we find our soul. We find life, we find freedom, we find release, 
we find forgiveness, we find our way forward, all of us, in a new way before God and one another. But I have to tell you, the thought of it makes me tremble, makes my knees shake and my heart break, my eyes burn. I don't want to go alone. Let's go together. Let's go together to the cross. In just a few minutes, we're going to bring our cross out and put it right there, this symbol, and invite you on this day, dear friends, white and black, gay and straight, powerful and weak, rich and poor, powerful and oppressed. Oh, sweet ones, let us go together, trembling, yet hopeful before the cross, to deal with its truth that we might find our souls, find salvation. So one day when we sing that song, were you there when they crucified the Lord, we can say yes. And were you there when they nailed him to the tree? Yes. And were you there when they pierced him in the side? Yes. Were you there when they laid him in the tomb? Yes. Father and Son and Holy Spirit. Amen.